Good morning, Grace. We welcome you to worship at Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Whether you are here in person, uh, I'm going to let you figure that out, whether you're here in person or not, uh, or whether you are joining us online, we're glad that you are here. I have several announcements uh, to make. Uh, Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock, there will be a prayer meeting here. We invite you to come. Ash Wednesday is on, obviously, Wednesday. Um, and it's this coming Wednesday, we will be having a chili supper at 5.30 and then we will repair to the sanctuary for the Ash Wednesday service and we will be having our normal discussion on the art of neighboring. If you are planning on coming for the dinner, uh, please let Becky know in the church office so that Becky Ogburn will know how many people to prepare chili for. Um, there's no mention in the Bible of Jesus doing a miracle of making more chili. <laughs> so we didn't cover that in seminary, but I am preaching on the feeding of the 5,000 today, but taking a little different tack. Also, Friday at 7 o'clock, we are having something that will be particularly of interest to uh, young parents with children, and that is... This will be the third time that Brent Vernon will be present with us. And Brent is from Florida. He is a singer, songwriter, Christian ventriloquist, author, and illustrator. And he will be here to do an evening concert at 7 o'clock. May, may I ask, how many are on Facebook? Ah, good. You are the advance army for advertising, although you may not know it. Good. Don't just like something that is put up on Grace Covenant's Facebook page. Share it. If you like it, it doesn't go any farther than you. It's like, oh, well, one person liked a, you know, whatever we put up there. But if you share it, it multiplies the message out to everybody that gets your news feed. So, I'm going to ask you to go home today, not during the service, <laughs> not during the sermon, but I'm going to ask you to go home today and get on your Facebook page, get on the Grace Covenant page, and then share the information about Brent Vernon and also the Ash Wednesday service, but that's not going up until after tonight. I want you to push the uh, Brent Vernon concert today and then tomorrow you can push the Ash Wednesday service. These are all of the announcements that I have, but Pastor Catherine has an announcement. Well, um, for the past 15 years, I have been praying and waiting for God to answer a very deep desire, deepest desire of my heart. And last weekend, um, God answered that prayer. I am engaged. <laughs> And um, so let me explain, because <laughs> I'm still in a state of shock myself, and I know that, that you all are shocked. Um, so this, uh, his name is Virgil Moore. He goes by, he has a nickname, he goes by Gator. There's a story behind it, but we call him Gator. Um, he is a dear friend of mine. Um, we've been friends actually for about two and a half years. Um, we met in Jacksonville at our church where I got ordained at. Um, he, he and I are both from Jacksonville. His family lives there. Um, and uh, we met at the singles group I started at the church I was at there. So we've been friends a long time. We've spent a lot of time together in groups and alone. And um, when I went to visit my family over Christmas, um, it blossomed into something more. And so um, I'm very um, grateful to God. He is an answer to prayer and a very good gift. And I love him. And I'm excited to um, get married. And we plan on getting married in Jacksonville at the church we met at um, on May 21st of this year. And so the plan is for him to move here. And um, I know he's very excited. <laughs> He's very excited to, uh, some of you might have met him before, him and my um, friend Maria had come to visit me for the installation service in July of last year, so he was here, he has been here once before, um, but he'll be moving here 
and he'll, he will need um, a full-time job, and we will be looking for a, um, as, as much as we love Chris and Penny, we will have to eventually <laughs> find a bigger place um, with maybe two bedrooms or so. So um, if you guys know of anybody that is, um, a rental becomes available somewhere near our church, um, we would probably want to be looking to move sometime in the summer. So that's the big announcement I have, and I will post pictures and put something in the newsletter this week so you can see them. (laughs) Our liturgist today is Dick Hellyer, and as far as I know, he has no announcements that can top that one. That's for sure. (laughs) Good morning, my fellow seekers, and uh, welcome to the next to the last day of February. Yes, where did February go? Don't worry, uh, March will be much longer. (laughs) Three days. Join me in cramming everything possible into the available time. Welcome to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. As we have come to know ourselves, Grace on Main. I don't know how that worked when it first came about, but I've just loved it ever since. I don't remember who did it. I remember somebody came up with the whole idea of Grace on Main, and, and it has stuck. Whether you're watching uh, from your bed between your toes, or if you're uh, sitting on your couch, (coughs) or if you're here in person in the sanctuary, we warmly welcome your presence in these uh, very stressful days of international violence and aggression. We hope that your worship with us will reward you with grace, humility, (coughs) love, kindness, and the wonderful glow of the peace of Jesus Christ. If you're visiting with us this morning, please look on the, in the pew rack in front of you and find one of these cards uh, and fill it out. We would love to get to know you better and the information you provide us will not leave the church. Uh, it won't go to anyone else. Uh, just drop it in the uh, uh, offering plate as it goes by a little later in the service and we will take (laughs) care of the rest. If you have questions, uh, just ask someone sitting near you uh, or speak to one of the pastors as you leave in the uh, later after after the service. We offer a full range of Sunday school uh, classes at 915 and the, as you heard, there is a Wednesday evening uh, hurried family supper, and this week it will be slightly different than it has been in the past. We offer child care and food for body and soul. Also, the choir practices on Wednesday. We won't this Wednesday much because we'll be singing, but uh, we would love to have you join us if you feel like exercising that glorious voice. The evening prayer meetings have restarted on Tuesday night here in the sanctuary, so it's 7 o'clock. It's an informal, casual worship service, and good for your soul. Join us on Tuesday, and we will enjoy seeing you. Next Sunday, March the 6th, will be a communion Sunday, and right after the worship, there will be our annual church luncheon. This is a full, a full formal feed <laughs> for anyone who wants to, to, to stay here after the service. Uh, it'll be right after worship, so we're gonna not waste any time. We will be, uh, be chowing down as quickly as we can. Usually the pastor will offer a blessing before we even leave this room. So, so uh, but it's a, it's a great event. 
Uh, this year the menu will be Scoots Fried Chicken. If you've not had Scoots Fried Chicken, it puts the Colonel to shame. <laughs> the, uh, and uh, whatever you bring, the, please bring a side to go along with all the other stuff and all the other stuff that people will bring. There is a sign-up sheet downstairs on the table by the fellowship hall where the big TV is. Uh, and if you would uh, please give us your <coughs> signature, or not signature, just tell us that you're going to be there and a clue about what you might bring. It may keep us from in ending up with all desserts. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so uh, please sign up after church today and, and don't miss it. It'll be a great time and great food and fellowship. I would also call your attention to the flyer in the bulletin today regarding Easter flowers. For those of you who may wish to either uh, celebrate something or memorialize something, uh, it's your opportunity to put flowers in the church even if you don't have the ability to arrange them. So you can do it with just 10 bucks, as many 10 bucks as you want to put in. So. But uh, I call your attention to it, and, and it'll be a good opportunity. With that, let us worship God.
Although God is always present, come near to the Lord and he will come near to you. Please join me in declaring responsibly the call to worship as it is printed in your bulletin and as you will see it on the screens. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Let us worship the Lord with all of our being. Let us pray. <coughs> Lord, we love you, we worship you, we praise your holy name. There is nothing greater than you. We stand in awe of your majesty. Words are not enough to describe your beauty. Thank you for inviting us into your presence, for calling us your children. We are humbled by your great love for us. Lord, we don't want to just be hearers of your word, but doers. Speak to us and convict us, Holy Spirit, to do good works in your name. We love you, and we love serving you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our opening song. And since this is new, the choir will sing the first verse and chorus, and then we will sing the first verse and chorus again and invite you to join us.
God is a God of justice, waiting to be gracious to us, yearning to have pity on us. Blessed are all who wait for the Lord. In faith, let us make our confession to God as we pray together the corporate prayer of confession, followed by a silent and personal confession of our personal sins and failures. God of peace and hope, we confess to hold them tightly to things we cannot control. We let worry consume us and dictate our actions, and we tell ourselves a lie that you are not enough. Forgive us for our failure to rest in your provisions. You always give us exactly what we need, when we need it, and with a measure of grace we don't deserve. May we put our trust in you alone. Amen. The foundation of the Christian faith is based on John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world con to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let us receive the good news of the gospel, knowing that our salvation is secured through our belief as Je in Jesus as the son of God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
use a lot of utility players here. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. It's familiar territory to many. <clears throat> After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw the large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When people saw that the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> I'm still recovering from bronchitis and I'm still kind of rough so as soon as we got done singing the anthem I grabbed a cough drop <coughs> and um, reminded me of the story of the, the preacher of the 19th century who always kept a little container of white mints in his pocket and would put one in his mouth and let it dissolve as he preached the sermon and when the little mint was dissolved, he knew it was time to end the sermon. <laughs> Until one particular Sunday, he grabbed a collar button instead of one of the mints. <laughs> well, I don't have a collar button. I have a Hall's mentholiptus cough drop. So those of you in the front rows, your eyes may water. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we spend too much of our time thinking how inadequate we are, how little we have to offer. Instead of focusing on how adequate you are and how great your provision is, that we might join you and be used of you in your kingdom. Help us to hear anew your call to serve those in our neighborhood, those in our workplace, those in our school, our friends, our acquaintances, that we might introduce them to the God of all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
In his own mind, he is a complete and total failure. Raised in the lap of luxury, given the finest education available at the time, an adopted member of the royal house, he has every right to claim the role of mover and shaker. So what is he doing out here in the desert, herding his father-in-law's sheep? Moses reflects upon his life, and if you want to follow the story, it's in Exodus chapter 3. I'll be going back and forth between Exodus 3 and John 6. Moses reflects upon his life. He uses a shepherd's staff to pull down a young stray from the rocks. Forty years he had spent in Egypt. Forty years living in Pharaoh's household. He was never content, never comfortable, always troubled by the injustice he saw around him. For his sister, Miriam, was his nursemaid. And she told him who he really was, a Hebrew slave, yet one rescued from the Nile by Pharaoh's daughter. How is it possible that one man could live off the sweat and toil of another man? It troubled Moses. And how could he, in truth, a Hebrew, watch as members of his own family struggled to survive in bondage while he enjoyed freedom and privilege? Moses remembers the day it all came to a head. He stumbles upon an Egyptian overseer mercilessly beating a Hebrew slave. And the anger wells up within him at the injustice until it boils over. Suddenly there's a rock in his hand. And as the overseer's cudgel descends toward the slave, so the rock in Moses' hand descends towards the head of the overseer. And within seconds it's over. The Hebrew slave is free. And the Egyptian overseer lies dead at Moses' feet. Moses looks around. Has anyone seen? Will anyone tell? And hastily he buries the overseer's body and returns to the palace. The next day, two Hebrew slaves are fighting. Moses attempts to break up the fight. And one of the slaves asks, will you kill us as you did the Egyptian? Moses flees to the desert, Midian, across the Red Sea. He marries and settles down. He's a family man now, far from the politics of Egypt. Another 40 years has almost passed since he left Egypt. How did he end up here in the Midianite desert on this side of the mountain herding sheep? Once he had dared to believe that he would make a difference in Egypt, and now this. Moses leads his father-in-law's flocks east to the mountain steps where it is cooler. The sheep graze, and Moses ponders. Moses strikes out with the flocks. He has never done this before. He leads the flock on a two-day journey. He's alone with the sheep, he thinks. Moses had seen just about everything there was to see in the desert. <coughs> The pulsating heat from the desert floor creating mirages that disappeared as soon as you approached them. Lightning storms dancing across the mountain peaks. Sudden torrents of rain that could swell dry wadis to flood stage in minutes. Dust storms that could spring up instantaneously to transform the landscape and threaten all life. But this is something Moses has never seen. It is so curious that he is forced to step aside to see this curiosity. It is a bush. It burns. It is on fire. And yet it is not consumed. Moses stands in awe. And the bush speaks. The voice calls him by name. Moses! Moses! Surely there's someone in the rocks playing a game. 
We encounter God in the midst of daily life. That's where we encounter God. I, I hope when you come to church, you come with the expectation you're going to encounter God here. But we don't just encounter God here. We encounter God in daily life. And sometimes we are the means by which other people may encounter God. Moses wasn't doing anything special. He was just doing his job. It was an ordinary day on an ordinary mountain. And yet it is here that Moses encounters God. Moses wasn't even looking for God. But God was looking for Moses. And God is looking for you. God is looking for your neighbors. God is looking for the people that you associate with, your friends, your family. And God has work for you as well. God is about to connect the dots between Moses' past, his present, and his future. He thinks his life is over. But God has a purpose for Moses to fulfill. And God has a purpose for you as well. The burning bush becomes emblematic of the condition of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt. They are oppressed. They are overworked. They are persecuted. And yet through all of this, in spite of a ruler bent on annihilating them, they continue to prosper and thrive. The reason for this was that just as with the bush that burned and was not consumed, God was in the midst of God's people. God hears the cry of the Hebrew slaves in bondage. God remembers his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and God acts to free the slaves. There's only one small detail. God's not going to do it alone. He requires a human agent. God will not merely reach down and strike Pharaoh and the Egyptians. God will use Moses. And so Moses must return to Egypt where he's a wanted man even after 40 years. He must risk returning to the place from which he is a fugitive murderer. God calls us as we are, where we are. Moses' confidence in himself was at an absolute nadir. Forty years ago, he would have accepted the commission and returned to Egypt to free the slaves under his own power. Those days were gone, and he's now full of excuses as you read the story. I'm not a good public speaker. Who am I that I should go and speak to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt, he asks. Moses was obviously conscious of his inadequacies. Let me tell you, this is not in my script. This is true confession time. Every time I step into that pulpit, I have a conversation with God. Who am I? I know what my own spiritual life is like. Who am I that I, I should speak to these people that I love? And yet that call is on my life, whether I like it or not, whether I feel adequate or not, whether I'm full of excuses or not. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Forty years had done nothing to wash away the bitterness of Moses' own failures. Perhaps you've asked the same kind of question. Who am I to reach out to my neighbors in Jesus' name? What can I do? What can I say? What do I have to offer? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that there is no way God could possibly use you? Because you live with you. <laughs> and if you don't live with you, somebody else lives with you. And if you won't tell yourself that, they will. <laughs> have you ever felt that your past is so haunted that your present might very well prevent your future? Who am I that I should speak up? Who am I that I should take action? Who am I that I should do that? All of us suffer from feelings of inadequacy, insecurity, and fear of failure. 
Even the most successful among us, if they are honest, will admit to these feelings. And compound these feelings with those that come after a failure, and you will understand the mind of Moses. During World War I, Theodore Seuss Geisel, Dr. Seuss, his Boy Scout troops sold a record number of war bonds, and the boys were to be presented with medals by former President Theodore Roosevelt. Geisel's troop sat on the stage as Roosevelt praised them and called out their names one by one. And finally, young Theodore was left alone on the stage with Roosevelt. And the former president looked at his list and then looked at this boy. And then he glared at the embarrassed boy. What is this little boy doing here? Which in if you know anything about Theodore Roosevelt, he would have blustered that out loud. <laughs> Unfortunately, Geisel's name had been left off the list by accident. Years later, explaining why he felt insecure in crowds and seldom gave speeches, he recalled the shame. I can still hear people saying, what is he doing here? Facing a crowd caused Dr. Seuss to retreat from public speaking and teaching. But he benefited from this flashpoint experience. He redirected his efforts and went into writing and illustrating children's books, bringing joy to millions of fans. All this from a man whose high school art teacher told him, you will never learn to draw. And whose Dartmouth College fraternity voted him least likely to succeed. God takes Moses and each one of us where we are, as we are. God's not looking for capability as much as God is looking for availability. It is God who qualifies the unqualified. It is God who provides the adequacy for those who feel totally inadequate. We need only be obedient to the call. And the rest will come in time. My cough drop is done, thank you. <laughs> no, it's not. I found some more. Take this morning's scripture lesson as an example. Jesus goes to the far side of the Sea of Galilee from where he has been teaching. Commentators say that Jesus likely withdrew to the barren hillsides on the east bank of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus is trying to get away from these crowds that keep showing up all the time. And the hills would be an ideal area for him to climb and be alone with his disciples. And Jesus often spent time in the hills. It's where he went to get away. Now if you read through scripture, you find out that mountains are considered places of divine encounter. Moses on Mount Sinai, Jesus, Mount of Transfiguration. Consider Psalm 121, I will lift my eyes to the hills, from whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. In Matthew, Jesus delivers the Sermon on the Mount from a high place. So Jesus withdraws, but the crowd follows him, and it's near the time of Passover. Jesus' reputation as a healer has drawn them. And Jesus sees the crowd. They're far from home. They're on a journey. And he calls Philip over to him and said, Philip, these people are going to be hungry. Find a way to feed them, please. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, often portrayed as the tactician of the disciples, the, the, the planner, the, the go-to guy to get something done, looks out at the crowd. And it's huge. John indicates 5,000, but in the Greek does not use the word people. He uses the word anthropos, or men, 5,000 men. Now, Matthew telling this story writes, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So you add in the women and the children to the 5,000 men, and you could have as many as 15,000 to 20,000 people. And they're in the middle of nowhere. There's no town nearby. There's no place to buy food. And the amount of money required to feed such a crowd is beyond the disciples' resources. Andrew does a quick calculation. There's a mathematician in every crowd. 
Even six months' wages, approximately 200 denarii for a single worker, couldn't cover it. It's a hopeless situation. Meanwhile, another disciple, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, has been seeking another solution. He goes out looking for food. Anybody got any food? You got any food? Anybody got any food? Anybody anybody have any food? You want to contribute? (sighs) Maybe somebody brought something. Maybe everyone brought something and there's no food crisis at all. That would be a nice solution, wouldn't it? I envision Andrew walking through the crowd. Does anyone have any food on them? Did anybody bring lunch? And no one knows why he asked, and the people just shake their head. They shrug their shoulders. They lift up empty hands. But a young boy digs in his bag, a resourceful young buck, and he offers up his lunch, five barley loaves and two fish. Ah, but the story gets better in the Greek. The story gets better in the Greek. The word for fish is apsos in the Greek. However, the form of the noun here is apsarion, and it means small fish. (laughs) Five barley loaves and two fish. Two sardines. A feast for one. And the crowd is curious. They're looking to the disciples and Jesus, curious to see what Jesus will do. And he instructs the disciples, tell everyone to sit down on the grass. And he asks the boy, may I borrow your lunch? You'll get it back. I don't think he said that, but he does get it back. And Jesus prays. And he blesses the bread and the fish. Now you have to know that barley loaves are the food of the poor. This is a poor kid. This is a poor man's lunch. And he places the pieces of bread and pieces of fish in baskets. And he tells the disciples to distribute the food. And everyone eats. And the baskets miraculously, like the oil cruet of the widow of Zarephath, never give out. They never run out of fish and loaves. In fact, when it's all over, the disciples pick up the leftovers and there are 12 baskets of leftovers. I once heard a sermon from a liberal pastor indicating that the miracle was not Jesus multiplying loaves and fishes. The miracle was that the little boy sharing his lunch shamed the adults into sharing what they had brought too. I don't know about you, but I believe the people of Jesus' time were smart enough to tell the difference between a miracle and a potluck. (laughs) Did everybody decide to bring loaves and fishes for lunch? Surely somebody brought carrots and yogurt. (laughs) I'm looking at Catherine, she's a vegetarian. (laughs) Just teasing. Nobody brought olives, nobody brought figs, dates, cold lamb, well, warm lamb, or grapes. I'm going to stick with the miracle that all all four of the gospel writers record. What the boy did was necessary to the story. He didn't have much, but he was willing to give what he had. We serve God best when we give what we have, where we are, by offering it up to God's service. When it comes to doing ministry, especially with our neighbors and our friends, the point is clear. Don't give what you don't have. Frankly, you can't give what you don't have. But if you're willing to share what you do have, no matter how small or insignificant it might be, God can bless you and bless others in ways you can't imagine. The famous missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, once wrote, depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's provision, God's supply. He is too wise a God to frustrate his purposes for lack of funds. And he can just as easily supply them ahead of time as afterwards and he much prefers doing so. That has to do with lack of resources as well as lack of funds. 
Like Theodore Geisel, many of Jesus' disciples probably looked at the little boy with the paltry lunch and said, what is this little boy doing here? The disciples were looking pretty much at the paltry lunch. So was Jesus. But the disciples were looking at what they couldn't do, what the lunch couldn't do. Feed 5,000 men, feed 20,000 women and children. You must be kidding. But Jesus was looking at what God could do. This keeps coming up in Scripture. Lazarus has been dead for four days. Everybody's going, oh, don't bring him back. He's going to stink. <laughs> when the boy gave his lunch to Jesus, the multitude had lunch. We don't know the boy's name. But we do know his story, and it has been told by all four gospel writers all the way down from the time of Jesus. Like the woman who bathed Jesus' hair, and, or bathed Jesus' feet, and anointed Jesus with the oil of nard, we remember the story. That little boy is famous. Now back to the Moses story for a moment. God appears to Moses in the burning bush. Moses turns aside to see, and God reveals his whole plan of how he's going to rescue the Hebrew slaves from Egypt and bring them into the promised land. And Moses, like most of us, see problems, not possibilities. He's looking to himself. And in Exodus 4, 1, Moses says to God, but suppose, <laughs> suppose they, the Hebrew slaves and Pharaoh, do not believe me or listen to me, but say, the Lord didn't appear to you. And God asks Moses a simple question. What do you have in your hand? Moses looks. It's a shepherd's staff. It's a tool, a symbol of his job for the last 40 years. And God tells Moses, throw it on the ground. I believe that implied in that command are several questions. Are you willing to let go of the familiar to begin a new adventure with me? Are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to look beyond your own inadequacies and look to what I will provide? Are you willing to give what you have and let me use it and then see something miraculous happen? God rarely calls the qualified. However, we see repeatedly in Scripture that God qualifies the called. What is that in your hand? Think of all the resources God has given you. Think of all the things about your personality, your makeup, <coughs> who you are, that make you who you are. Is it a staff? Is it a poor child's lunch? Are you willing to let God use it? Are you willing to trust God to use you even when you believe God can't? Obviously, God can't use me. And you're convinced that you have little or nothing to offer. You can't give what you don't have. God's not asking that. God never asks that. But God can and will use what you do have. You just have to turn it over to him. And that starts with your whole life. What are the needs around you in your neighborhood, in your friendship circle? What are you willing to risk and turn over to God's direction and blessing so that God might use you? Let me tell you a story. In 1972, the year I graduated from high school, which seems a long way off after yesterday, <laughs> NASA launched the exploratory space probe Pioneer 10. And according to Leon Jeroff in Time magazine, the sat satellite's primary 21-month mission was to reach Jupiter, photograph the planet and its moons, and beam data to Earth about Jupiter's magnetic field, its radiation belts, its atmosphere. Scientists regarded this as a bold plan, for at that time, no Earth satellite had ever gone beyond Mars. And they feared that the asteroid belt would destroy the satellite before it could reach its target. 
But Pioneer 10 accomplished its mission and much, much more. Swinging past the giant planet in November of 1973, Jupiter's immense gravity hurled Pioneer 10 at a higher rate of speed toward the edge of the solar system. And at one billion miles from the sun, Pioneer 10 passed Saturn. And at some two billion miles, it hurtled past Uranus. Neptune at nearly 3 billion miles, Pluto at almost 4 billion miles, and by 1997, 25 years after its launch, Pioneer 10 was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. That's billion with a B. And despite that immense distance, Pioneer 10 continued to beam back radio signals to Earth until 2003 when it sent its last signal to Earth from 7.6 billion miles away. Perhaps most remarkable, writes Jeroff, those signals emanated from an 8-watt transmitter, which radiates about as much power as a bedroom nightlight, and take more than nine hours to reach Earth. The little satellite that could was not qualified to do what it did. Engineers designed Pioneer 10 with a useful life of just under three years, but it kept going and going, and going. By simple longevity, its tiny 8-watt transmitter radio accomplished more than anyone thought possible. And that's the way it is when we offer up what we have to serve the Lord. God can work through even someone with 8-watt abilities. God cannot work, however, through someone who quits or never tries. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen. And I still have (laughs) plenty of cough drop left, but I'm going to (laughs) stop. Not many people admit to chewing on a collar button. No person was ever honored for what he received, except God. Honor has been the reward for what people gave. He does not possess wealth that allows it to possess him. Our morning offering will be received.
pray with me, please? Dear Lord, we dedicate this money for the work of this church. And we ask you to use all that we have and all that we are in your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Doug wrote that sermon for me. I'm up here saying, who am I that I can do this? So I'm going to ask the Lord to qualify me to lead you today in prayer. I have had a terrible time writing this because of the, what's been going on. Give me a minute. Please, please pray with me. Dear Lord, we come to you with thanks and with praise for allowing us to be here today in a nation, in a country, in a state that allows up to us to worship you without fear of reprisal or detention or worse. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for us that we do not acknowledge. We thank you for the things that you've done for us that we don't, aren't even aware of. We lift up to you now those who are ill, those who are dying, those who are grieving, that you will put your arms around them and give them the comfort of your presence. And Lord, we lift up to you our, our leaders, our state, our national, our international leaders, because gosh, we really need you right now. I found a couple of things, Lord, on Facebook that I'm going to use in this prayer because they say much more eloquently everything that I think is on our hearts today and much better than I could ever say them. Lord Jesus, we come to you in humility and sadness as we watch the events unfolding in Ukraine. We pray for the Ukrainian people that you would keep them safe, provide what they need, and show them that they can trust you in all situations. Father, give them courage and endurance. <clears throat> show them mercy and help them in ways that they can see your mighty hand. Strengthen the church and help believers to be your hands and feet during this time of distress. We also pray for the people of Russia as they see their children go to war and sustain the consequences of their leader's actions. May they seek you and find you as the answer to their needs as well. Lord God, we express our confidence in you. We do not know what tomorrow may bring, and we know that with war comes tears, heartache, and significant loss. But we also know that you are God, and if we look to you, you will guide us. Help us prepare for the coming crisis and show us how to honor you so that more people may trust in the salvation that only comes through you. We entrust the future to you because we can't make the world peaceful. We can't stall tanks from roaring down roads. We can't prevent children from having to hide in bunkers. We can't convince game manufacturers or the news to stop turning war into a video game. We can't silence the sounds of bombs tearing neighborhoods apart. <clears throat> we can't turn a guided missile into a bouquet of flowers. We can't make a warmonger have an ounce of empathy. We can't convince ambassadors to quit playing truth or dare. We can't deflect a sniper's bullet from turning a wife into a widow. We can't stave off a country being reduced to ash and rubble. We can't do any of that. The only thing we can do is love the next person we encounter without any conditions or strings to love our neighbors so fearlessly that it starts a ripple that stretches from one horizon to the next. We can't force peace on the world, but we can become a force of peace in the world because sometimes all it takes is a single lit candle in the darkness to start a movement. Lord, make us candles of comfort in this world. Let us burn with peace. For Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
have in your hand? You know, the interesting thing about that story is I doubt that any Jewish mother would let a little boy go listen to Jesus halfway around the, the Sea of Galilee. I'm sure that that Jewish mother, knowing what we know about Jewish mothers, and all mothers, mm -hmm. they were there also. And if they packed him a lunch, <laughs> they probably had a lunch too. But it says in scripture, a little child shall lead them. The little boy was the only one willing to give his lunch up. I think that's significant. What do you have in your hand? Go out into the world in peace. Serve the risen Christ. Know that God loves you and that in this place you are loved. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.